The Lord be with you. Because of the inclement weather, we have cut all of the music from our service tonight. But I would suggest that on your own, if you have a hymnal or if you can find these on the internet, you might find time in your devotional to sing before the Lord hymn number 609, Jesus Sinners Doth Receive. And number 702, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Or number 570, Just As I Am, Without One Plea. Each of these suits the season of Lent and our theme for this year rather well. Brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, on this day, the church begins its holy season of prayerful and penitential reflection. Our attention is especially directed to the holy sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. From ancient times, the season of Lent has been kept as a time of special devotion, self-denial, and humble repentance, born of a faithful heart that dwells confidently on his word and draws from it life and hope. Let us pray that our dear Father in heaven, for the sake of his beloved Son, and in the power of his Holy Spirit, may richly bless this Lenten time for us. That we may come to Easter with glad hearts and keep the feast in sincerity and truth. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. From seeking after other gods, from misusing your name, from forgetting to call upon you in every trouble, and from faltering in prayer, we return to you, O Lord. From faltering in worship, and not always hearing and learning your Gladly, we return to you, O Lord. From disrespecting the authorities you have placed in our lives, we return to you, O Lord. From disregard for our neighbor's well-being, from failing to nurture the most important relationships in our lives, from our lack of complete honesty toward one another and our failure to help our neighbors improve their possession and income, we return to you, O Lord from speaking hurtful words about others and failing to explain our neighbor's actions in the kindest way, from covetous thoughts and actions, we return to you, O Lord. To your gracious word of love for us in Christ, we return. To our identity as children of God, baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we return to Christ's body and blood, given and shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins, we return. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Steadfast Lord, you remain a solid foundational rock, even when we are shaking. We thank and praise you for your gracious invitation to return to you, not only during this Lenten season, but day by day. We are prone to wander, yet your love for us never wavers, and you constantly call us to return to you. Bless our Lenten journey. Let it be for us a time of daily returning to you, that we may be your own and live under you in your kingdom and serve you in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves 
and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Holy and gracious God, we confess our sin to you. We cannot overcome our own sinful nature, our desiring, our thinking, our acting, and our speaking, all the blessings that you provide through your good creation. We've warped and turned into instruments of sin. Lord, have mercy on us. We have not loved you with our whole heart, soul, body, mind, and strength. We've neglected the needs of our neighbors, both those closest to us and strangers alike. Lord, have mercy on us. For the times when our faith has wavered, for moments of arrogance, for petty jealousies, and for the small and big ways we have sought revenge, Lord, have mercy on us. For placing our own personal needs over the needs of our community and over the needs of other people in our lives, Lord, have mercy on us. For the times that our hearts have turned away from worshiping you, Lord, have mercy on us. For the times when we have not prayed as regularly and trustingly as we should, Lord, have mercy on us. For the times when we have shrunk away from opportunities to give witness to your grace to us in Christ Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us. For the times when we have displayed bad attitudes toward those who struggle in life, imagining that we deserve better than they do, Lord, have mercy on us for seeking comfort for ourselves and not being as concerned about those who suffer injustice. Lord, have mercy on us. For explaining our neighbor's actions in unkind ways. For using our words as weapons against others. For standing in judgment over those who most need to hear a word of grace. Lord, have mercy on us. For the times when we have been careless toward this beautiful world that you have created for us to live in, Lord, have mercy on us. For all of the other sins, those of which we are aware and those to which we remain blind, we plead with you to forgive us and to fill us with the power of the Spirit to amend our lives. Lord, have mercy on us. Because of Jesus paying the price for our sins on the cross, God readily forgives all who return to him in repentance and faith. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, you call us to turn from sin, turn to you, and live. Help us to recognize our sin for what it is, confess it to you, and then receive the forgiveness of our sins accomplished by our Lord Jesus on the cross, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Ash Wednesday is from Joel, 
the second chapter. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not return and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber between the vestibule and the altar. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians, the 5th and 6th chapter. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listen to you. And in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found in our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We're treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you'll have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. 
Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. When you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. When you fast, Anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay for you up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Lent is a great time to start something new. Either to start fasting to deny yourself something in which you have found great pleasure, not so that you punish yourself, but instead so that you can use every craving and turn it to longing for the word of the Lord and for fellowship with him. Longing for the self-discipline that comes from such a fast. Or perhaps starting something new by beginning something you haven't done before something that you've been meaning to, to get to. I'm longing for the day when we can all gather together again without any kind of restrictions. But in the meantime, in the meantime, I'm going to turn my attention not to something new so much as something old. The Old Testament prophet, Joel, gets us oriented to the season of Lent. He highlights the problems that we face with being both sinner and saint in this world. He lays out the solution for it before all of us, and it is something very old. He calls on us to return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful. God calls us to simply return to him because he addresses all our needs and provides for our salvation. We don't really know when the prophet Joel lived, and I, I think that of all of the Old Testament prophets, he's the most mysterious. He tells us about a great army that's coming. He tells us about devastation that comes from the locusts. And we don't know, are the locusts a metaphor for the army? Or is the army a metaphor for the locusts? Is the, are the people of God going to be destroyed by an invasion of, of insects? 
or of armies. And it doesn't really matter. And it's really appropriate that we don't know exactly when he lived or what particular calamity he was facing. Because his message is a universal message at all times. We are to return to the Lord our God, who is gracious and merciful, to turn in repentance, to turn again to the salvation which is ours in Jesus Christ. We know that Joel was a prophet, and he probably ministered in the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. And the book that bears his name is really short. It's only 73 verses long. Just three chapters, but it's rich and deep and complex. The outline of his prophecy is very simple. Part one, everything will fall before the invasion. An invasion of locusts will destroy all vegetation. So the people should fast at the temple and offer a prayer of lament over the coming destruction. But if you thought that was bad, in part two, Joel tells us the day of the Lord is coming and is near. And he describes the Lord's army using the imagery of the destroying locusts. And then issues that call to return to the Lord and pray at the temple. And part three, God responds. First, he responds to the locust plague, offering healing and restoration, and then on a much bigger scale, God responds to the day of the Lord, giving salvation to all who call on his name. and passing judgment on all who play fast and loose with the people of God. Our reading for today that we've already heard from Joel chapter 2 is taken right from the middle of that book. The imagery of the swarm of locusts has already been completed, and the comparison to the Lord's army and the day of the Lord has been made, and the reader is left to wonder what can be done about this? It's a little bit like that scene where the rich young man approaches Jesus and asks him what good deed he should do to earn eternal life. Jesus knows this man, and he loves him, and he answers him quite honestly, basically telling him, you have something that gets in the way between you and God. You are devoted above all things to yourself, to your welfare, to your riches and your place in society. After Jesus undercuts the man's love of money, he goes away sad. And Jesus turns to his disciples and explains how difficult it is with somebody, for somebody who has been given wealth and every blessing to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples respond greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? And you can almost hear Joel's audience saying the same thing in our Old Testament reading for today. If everything is going to be destroyed before the day of the Lord, who then can be saved? But Joel brings good news and a simple promise. Return to the Lord your God. He is gracious and merciful. It'll come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
They only need to return to the Lord their God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting of disaster. They only needed to realize that they couldn't stop the swarming locusts or the advancing army or the judgment day that would come. It's kind of like the parable that Jesus tells of the man who builds on the rock and the man who builds on the sand. The man who builds on the sand so foolishly finds that when the storms come and beat against it, the house falls, and great is the fall of it. But for the man who builds on the rock, the storms come and beat against that house, and it stands because it is built on the rock. Return to the rock. Return to the Lord your God. So that when the storms come, they're not going to completely destroy you. I haven't seen a lot of locusts. And thank God we have not been invaded by any armies. But yet, we have enemies. Some of them as big as the armies. Some of them as small as the individual locusts. There are sins. They are the forces of Satan. Our sins are kind of like those, those little bugs. Small, unassuming little things that do a little bit of damage, but when they come in a swarm, when you add it all up, when you look at a lifetime of those sins, it destroys everything. It decimates everything good in its path. One little locust doesn't seem that terrifying. But when the entire list of your sins is considered, it's breathtaking. Romans 6 tells us that the wages of sin is death. And Ezekiel tells us the soul that sins, it shall die. The locust swarm of our sins is terrifying indeed. So Joel's words can and should hit you the same way they hit the Israelites. The day of the Lord will come, and with it, immense destruction and terror. And of yourself, there's, there's no way to escape it. All those times that you cut corners, all those times that you cheated, all those times that you posted mean things or shared a, a nasty story about someone, all of the times that you elicited a laugh from somebody by mocking somebody else, all of the opportunities you had to show love that the, to the ones the Lord gave you to love, and you didn't. When you treated your parents with contempt or dismissed your mother's request to clean up your mess, when you blew off worship because you just didn't care to hear what that fat old preacher was going to say, when you strung together a string of curse words that would make a dock worker blush, when it was your opinion that you knew better than God about everything, that swarm of locusts, the destruction of everything alive, is the least of your worries. Eternal death, damnation, those should terrify you. And Joel brings the good news to you, as well as to the hearers of whatever time he lived in. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Return to the Lord your God. 
in spite of your sinful rejection of him, he invites you to return and promises to bless you. Stop trusting in yourself and look to him. Know that you can't stop the swarming, le- the swarming locusts and you cannot prevent the judgment day. You don't even know when it is going to be. But it will come and everyone will be affected. And the only solution is to return to the Lord, your God. Over the coming weeks, we're going to explore more deeply how God's call to return plays out in our lives. We'll do it by walking in the steps of the disciples and those who accompany Jesus in the final weeks of his life. We're going to hear the call to return as it echoes in their ears and come to understand things the way they finally did. First in their ignorance, and then after the resurrection, and especially after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. In all of its beauty, and simplicity. Return to the Lord your God, for he is the one who can save you. As simple as that. Next Wednesday, we're going to spend some time with Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. Return to prayer will be our theme. And similar themes will follow each week of Lent. And I invite you to be here if you can for our midweek service as we follow Joel's call to gather the people and consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders and gather the children, even even nursing infants. We'll all come together and listen to God's call and return to the one who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you, and give you Peace. Amen.